Thanks for all the thumbs up. I appreciate it. I'm going to dive in. Um, first of all, welcome. It's so lovely to see um, all of you and to see your names or your faces or your pictures. I'm Julie Cronister. I'm a faculty member in the uh, department in the Clinical Mental Health Counseling Program. Uh, she, her, brief audio description. I'm a white skinned person with black rim glasses, light brown hair, and uh, I've got a white background. Um, I also just want to acknowledge that we are on Ramatash Ohlone land, and um, we further want to acknowledge that these lands and waters are made up of many other indigenous peoples and nations in our field work and around the Bay Area. Um, I'm going to hand it over to my um, partner in crime, Dr. O, introductions. Hi, yeah, I'm Dr. O, uh, pronouns she, her. Uh, thanks for doing the land acknowledgement, Julie. And what else? Oh, yeah, image description, white skin person, red lips today. I don't know what my hair color is right now, brownish, reddish, curlyish, and uh, I've got a, a tapestry of a, a winter or a, a mountain scene behind me in browns and greens. And let's see, yeah, I think that's all I was supposed to do. Oh, uh, we don't have, we only have about 30 minutes, so we don't have time for everyone to introduce themselves, but we thought for community building, just if folks want to share in the chat, what's your favorite rainy day activity? So we can all sort of share something that is fun for ourselves to do in there. Um, and then I will turn it back to Dr. Cronister to take us through all this important info. Yeah. Okay, so um, why are you here? So we have invited all of you because we have a workforce training grant. And um, just, I'm gonna give you the big picture and some key concepts. It may feel a bit rushed, um, but you'll have all kinds of opportunities to email Dr. O and I with questions and concerns and, and, and how to go about this. But I just want to give a brief uh, overview of this, why we're doing it and, and how you apply. And then the second half of this, I have some partners, project partners coming on um, who are working with us to develop um, integrated behavioral health sites. And so they're going to be on be between 11 and 11.30. So that is, it's a perfect time for you to ask them questions. They'll probably share things about their site um, and that kind of thing. So just a uh, big picture first, I want to make sure everyone's access needs are met. If they're not, you can chat, we can do what we can. This is being recorded. Um, but if you ha are having a hard time, one with my pace, if you want me to repeat something, don't hesitate to put that in the chat. Um, I want to acknowledge a few things uh, beyond Dr. O and I, Dr. Streer is very much involved with this project as well. And we have four lovely, wonderful grad assistants, Christina Cabias, Ro Cordova, Chinui Igwe, and Shirley Sang. I don't know if any of them are on today, but I just want to acknowledge they are um, being super helpful for this project. Okay, so this is a, a, a behavioral health workforce grant, meaning the federal government uh, has decided um, based on solid information and research that we have not enough mental health or what we're terming behavioral health providers today in the workforce. Um, not so surprising. We have a mental health crisis. We have for quite some time. Um, and so the federal government saying we need to help institutions who train mental health providers to give them some incentive to, to get out there and work in our most underserved community agencies. And I'll talk a bit about this, but this particular workforce grant is designed to increase the supply of behavioral health providers, hence in this case, counselors in our program, with training in integrated behavioral health, particularly in the context of what we call these federally qualified health centers, which I'll get to. Um, and so this this project is really um, the goal of it is to give those who agree to the, the requirements of, of the project, uh, you receive a stipend, you get trained through our webinars on integrated behavioral health, and you also um, are out there on a training site that has some level of integrated behavioral health um, um, within its training. And I'll talk about that more. And Tiffany, uh, Dr. O, don't hesitate to jump in if I'm missing something big here. 
Um, I think I've talked briefly rationale. We have a mental health crisis, particularly with our youth. And this grant in particular is focused on that. They, the grant really wants more mental health counselors in integrated behavioral settings um, to address the needs of youth. Um, and so that's a big piece of it, as well as the fact that there's an access crisis, right? So many of our underrepresented, underserved communities are not getting access to health and behavior health care. And even if they do get access, there isn't enough providers who one are trained in integrated behavioral health two, and two don't have the um, either the cultural background or the language background needed. Right. So we're really looking for people who um, are from the very communities that we need to serve. Uh, this is just for you all to read if you don't realize the crisis in California um, with our youth, 104% increase in inpatient visits for suicide, suicide ideation, and self-injury among those 1 through 17. Sit with that. Um, so we all can hypothesize a lot about why this is going on, but we have a crisis with our youth and our college students. We also have an access crisis, as I just mentioned. Um, California behavioral health system is inadequate for both adults and youth, but access is demonstrably worse for youth. We're ranked 15th for adults and 39th for children. Um, and so, you know, less than a third of our California youth with behavioral issues actually get care. Um, so these are issues that we are trying to address as a state. Uh, mentioned crisis. Um, this is been named as one of California's most pressing healthcare priorities is getting more trained behavioral health providers in the pipeline into the workforce um, with a specific focus on meeting the needs of our most vulnerable and at risk youth from culturally and linguistic backgrounds. Um, okay, so the idea here is that we have received this grant and our project in particular titled Equity and Justice Focused Integrated Behavioral Health Counselor Training Project. I know that's a, a mouthful, but the idea here is, is that we would like to provide students with stipends and particularly 29 students who are in their final year of training with a stipend, which would um, position you to get trained in integrated behavioral health through our, our webinars, as well as training on the site. And the idea there is that we increase our workforce, um, we improve access, and we improve behavioral health. Those are aspirational goals. Um, let's see. A couple key concepts that I'm going to throw out that I think I've already thrown out, but integrated behavioral health, you will learn about this if you're part of this project. And by the way, our webinars are open to anyone at any time, even the ones going on right now. You can join these webinars. They're recorded. They're free. They're live. Um, and we're constantly posting those. Um, but a few things. Integrated behavioral health, just simply put, is an effort to address our fragmented healthcare system and more specifically um, bring in uh, all different health and allied health dis disciplines into one setting and ideally primary care. What we know is that communities, uh, underserved communities, are more likely to go um, look for mental health care in their primary care or with their family practitioner. We know there's a large proportion of people who show up to primary care with mental health issues. So the idea is, and there's different iterations of integrated behavioral health that, you know, it, some is in primary care, but there's other settings where we're doing integrated behavioral health, where there's a nurse practitioner, a social worker, a, a, a counselor, a psychiatrist, um, an outreach worker. So the idea is that it's sort of um, a multidisciplinary approach, everybody working um, as a team with the same outcome in mind. The other term that I'm gonna throw around, you'll hear is federally qualified health centers. Um, and I will uh, 
federally qualified health centers are otherwise known as community health centers are are health centers that receive funding from the federal government these health centers serve the most underserved um, these health centers serve those who cannot pay for health and behavioral health settings. Um, these health centers have to meet certain criteria um, um, by the federal government to receive funding. But this is a place where we would like to see our students doing training and, and, and entering the workforce. There is a need in these health centers for more behavioral health providers. And we often talk about we have a significant healthcare professional shortage uh, across California, um, and that's part of it. Let me see what time do we have here, Doctor O? Do you know the time? It's uh, it's forty three now, so we've only got about seventeen minutes left. Okay, uh, let's see. Let me start this and play this. See how this goes. Dentists, pharmacies, and behavioral health centers. When you have multiple health issues, you traditionally have to set up multiple appointments with these different specialists. Sometimes people get help for only some of their concerns. When that happens, it's hard to get well. Although certain concerns may seem unrelated, they are all part of a whole person, a system, and it's hard for the person's healthcare provider to help them reach whole health and wellness unless they are aware of and know about all of the concerns. Mm -hmm. When they know all concerns, they can help the person decide which options for care may be more effective. There's a new approach, integrated healthcare. For people with multiple health concerns, including mental illness and addiction, healthcare providers are adopting integrated care practices. That means they are teaming up with other healthcare providers to increase access to primary and preventative medical care, mental health care, addictions treatment, and sometimes dentistry, offering coordinated care, sometimes even in the same office. Community health centers and behavioral health centers are beginning to work together to provide services as a team and screen and refer people to each other's office for the services needed. A growing number of integrated care providers are in the same building. What does integrated care look like? Let's take a look. Meet Wendy. Wendy doesn't feel well. She has diabetes and bipolar disorder. Lately, Wendy's been sad and drained of energy. Last month, Wendy was in the hospital for complications from her diabetes. Now she needs to refill her medications and wants to see someone about how she's been feeling. She could go to a health clinic to see a doctor or nutritionist for her diabetes, a separate behavioral health center to see a counselor and psychiatrist for her bipolar disorder, and then head over to the pharmacy to pick up her medications. This time, Wendy is going to a place in her neighborhood where she can get primary care, mental health care, and addictions treatment. When Wendy gets to the center, she meets Renita, the receptionist. Renita helps Wendy enroll in the center's care. Wendy tells Renita about how she was just in the hospital, and she tells her why she's come in today. Wendy explains how depressed she feels, how she wants to talk to a counselor, how she needs a psychiatrist for her mental health medication, and a doctor for her diabetes. Renita gives Wendy a screening form, where Wendy shares that she drinks heavily but would like to stop. Renita explains to Wendy how at their center, she will have a caring team of professionals all at the same location to help her achieve her health goals. Renita then introduces Wendy to Nathan, the nurse. Nathan takes Wendy's blood sugar and is alarmed at how high it is. Wendy explains that she hasn't checked her blood sugar for a week because she doesn't own a blood sugar monitor and can't afford one. Wendy tells Nathan that she'd like to know how to take better care of herself. Nathan checks with Wendy's health insurance and sets up an appointment for Wendy to see a doctor on that same day. Wendy then sees Dr. Dynamite. Dr. Dynamite gives Wendy a physical, and while she's doing that, Wendy talks with the doctor about her bipolar disorder and diabetes. Dr. Dynamite is concerned about Wendy's worsening symptoms of depression and steps out of the room to call a consultant psychiatric provider who suggests an increase in Wendy's antidepressant medication. She then writes Wendy a new prescription for her diabetes medication and the change recommended by the psychiatric consultant and suggests that Wendy meet with her colleague, Luis, to talk more about her bipolar disorder. Dr. Dynamite indicates that she will also talk with Luis about Wendy's diabetes so that everyone is on the same page. She asks Wendy to check in with Nurse Nathan every day that week so they can together monitor her blood sugar. While Wendy is waiting for Luis to come into the exam room, Nathan talks with Wendy about managing her blood sugar, eating right, 
gives her tips to drink less, and advises her about her medication. Nathan then introduces Wendy to Louise, the center's licensed clinical social worker. Wendy feels comfortable enough to share her experiences and talks with Louise about her recent symptoms. Louise asks Wendy if they can meet on a weekly basis to start. Louise asks Wendy if she'd like to meet with Pia, a peer counselor. Luis explains that peer counselors are individuals on the care team who have experienced getting help for a mental health or addiction concern themselves and are trained in helping people who are working toward recovery just like they have. Wendy agrees that she would like to meet with Pia. Luis also gives Wendy a list of some nearby support groups that can help Wendy reduce her drinking. Nathan, Luis, Dr. Dynamite, and the other professionals that help care for Wendy at the center each know the outcomes of their visits with Wendy in one electronic health record. Before she heads home, Wendy chats with Nathan, who will work with Wendy to ensure she continues receiving regular care. Then there's just one last stop. Wendy stops by the on-site pharmacy to pick up her prescriptions. All of Wendy's new caregivers talk about Wendy's progress in regular morning meetings. Nurse Nathan regularly checks on Wendy to make sure she has what she needs to manage her health and to feel better. Wendy is more confident in talking about her behavioral health and medical issues with Nurse Nathan, Peer Counselor Pia, and LCSW Louise. They see Wendy regularly to make sure she's feeling better and educate her how diabetes can sometimes worsen feelings of depression. Wendy now checks her blood sugar daily, takes her medication on schedule, and eats carefully. She is drinking less each week and is talking about giving up alcohol altogether. She attends a nutrition class at the center and walks every day to lose weight and to help control her diabetes. Her blood sugar is controlled, and with counseling and support, her symptoms of depression are reduced. Since starting this new integrated care, Wendy hasn't had to visit the emergency room or go into the hospital. Wendy is on her way to wellness. Okay. So just a little window into Dr. Dynamite and integrated behavioral health. Um, and uh, when it comes to healthcare, whoops. there are many ways to get more statistics about the need for integrated behavioral health. Um, and a bit, I talked about federally qualified health centers. If you want to learn more about them, um, I have a link here. Um, but again, this is an, uh, a community health center that is in need of mental health providers. Um, these are located in high areas of high need. They're open to everyone despite, despite ability to pay. It's very comprehensive, as you heard with Dr. Dynamite and his group. Um, and also the, the consumers, patients, clients who are, are receiving care are part of the governing boards. Uh, one out of 12 people in the US rely on these health centers for care. And just to give you a sense of what our needs are in California in terms of um, the shortage, uh, we are about 40% met and we need 1500 or so more practitioners to remove this healthcare professional shortage um, designation. So that's something we want to go away. Okay. Who are we partnering with? Where might you consider doing an internship if you're interested in this program? Um, so we are partnering with our community federally qualified health centers. Some of these agencies probably look familiar to you. Health Right 360, um, uh, Mission Neighborhood Health, um, Planned Parenthood. We've had students at BART in the past. Um, so these are agencies that um, we are working with to establish um, training placements. We have established one with San Francisco Community Health Center. We are working with HealthRight and other of these agencies. Um, I hate to play another video, but this one is fabulous. I would like you all to, to listen to Lance talk about a San Francisco Community Health Agency, which is a federally qualified health center. For over 30 years at San Francisco Community Health Center, we've been striving and we have been providing the most comprehensive continuum of care, not just for the HIV community, but for the LGBTQ community, the trans community, and most recently the homeless community. This is our goal, is to ensure that we have as comprehensive, as holistic, and whole person-centered care as possible. Here at San Francisco Community Health Center, we treat the whole person. Our team uh, complies uh, behavioral health, dental, 
case management, outreach workers, the medical providers, of course, programs, even the people who cook the meals for our patients. I think what makes San Francisco Community Health Center so magical is that there's really nothing like this anywhere else. Our philosophy as an organization is that we never give up. We do whatever it takes to serve our clients in the most comprehensive, culturally competent manner possible. From the minute that I walked into this clinic, I knew that it was different because of the sense of community that this clinic offers. There is nowhere else that you can arrive and be greeted by somebody who looks like you or who has had a similar experience as you, who can connect you to a provider who's just going to be super responsive to your needs. Being able to come in here without feeling any type of stigma, without feeling like I'm less than or ostracized or just being picked on for being who I was is the greatest reward. 20 years ago, when I came out as who I am, there were really no services available, and I was seeking services for myself. And when I landed here at San Francisco Community Health Center, I just kind of like opened a treasure chest where all of these services are available for me. And I want each and every one who comes to our door to experience that. Our outreach team is grounded in the fact that our clients' needs are urgent. My team works with some of the hardest to reach, the folks here in, in San Francisco in the Tenderloin that are suffering incredibly. And we do the most amazing job because I have a talented, skillful, compassionate, empathic team. You know, imagine you're this person who lives outside in a tent, who has so much distrust in the medical system because you've been turned away and turned away, you know, time after time when you've tried to get help. And your things were stolen the night before, you haven't slept, you don't have any food. And someone from our team approaches you to try and give you something that you actually need and make you feel like your life is valued because we actually bring our services to the, the folks that we serve out in the community on our outreach team. Actually going and finding people and meeting them where they are and really taking the resources and knowledge and information that we have. And we tell them that we'll be back tomorrow if you're not ready to come in yet. And we remind them that their life matters. There's a special sauce here at San Francisco Community Center. What we do together when we're here in our office is we celebrate, we laugh together, and we actually create a culture of joy. Okay. I love that agency. Um, okay. Uh, so we work with San Francisco Community Consortium, which I just showed you. We also work with the San Francisco Health Network, which is part of Department of Public Health. Some of these agencies might look familiar to you, but we are also working with these agencies as possible training sites that are integrated behavioral health. And in particular, we're hoping to um, have our students work in these teen clinics as well, given the focus of this particular project. Um, and the other um, consortium that we're working with is Community Health Center Network, um, which is in Alameda County and the federally qualified health centers over there. Um, I have a list of them. We're working uh, right now with Lifelong and Latinica um, and hoping to have students at some of these other agencies as well. Um, and so these are also community health centers that are in need of your expertise and training. Um, I'm, I don't think I have time to show this one, um, but it will be available to you because you will get the PowerPoint. Um, but I do want to emphasize that integrated behavioral health 
also has a very strong presence in school-based health centers, otherwise known as wellness centers. So those of you who are interested in working in the school-based system, this is also um, a, a model that, that is being used. And La Clinica in particular has many school-based health centers where our youth are getting everything from reproductive services to nurse, nursing services to mental health and, um, and dentistry. Sorry. Um, I just found this and I want to just sort of put this up here because another piece of this grant, this, this grant is not only focused on those pursuing their, uh, you know, MFT license or their PCC license, um, but this is a, a project that is open to students who are also uh, school counseling students as well as college and career. Um, you know, integrated behavioral health tends to be more uh, in our health centers, of course, but there are team-based integrated settings in different areas. And so it's, it's, you aren't shut out of this project if you're not in a perfect integrated behavioral health center, um, but we are hoping that students who want do take this, um, try to find a, a placement that has some degree of integrated behavioral health. And our, our public school systems are doing this through their wellness centers. And I just kind of wanted to put this up there um, where you know they're offering all kinds of um, outreach, occupational therapy, nursing, mental health, that kind of thing. How are we doing? So with that said, our project, as I've mentioned, we have a website. Please do go look at that. Um, for this project, if you are interested in, in participating and would like to apply, um, sorry, I'm flipping through here. So, and I, this process may change slightly, but as it stands, I think this is how it will, will go. If you are interested in applying for this stipend, um, and, and doing the training in integrated behavioral health and, and seeking a site that has some degree of integrated behavioral health or team-based care in it, um, you will receive everyone who is starting an internship, their final internship in the fall, will receive an email with a link to a Qualtrics application. And you wanna submit the one-page application. You will read a student commitment form, which I'll show. And then you'll read an email, you'll receive an email of the notice of award. If you are awarded, you complete a student stipend form and a student commitment form, which I'll show you in a minute. And then you receive $5,000 in August and 5,000 in January. Uh, and with that, you attend 10 didactic trainings. This is what this was. I was just giving you a window into the first five of this year. Um, You'll attend those and they're also recorded. If you can't be there are live ones, you can attend the recorded ones. You need to complete 8891 with a B. And, and also it, when you do get your internship, we wanna make sure that will be an important part of, of the decision-making around whether this um, stipend is right for, for you. I know you're not going to remember this, but I'm just showing you this stuff so you see it's not going to be complicated to apply. This is the agreement form that's worth reading, and you will get that. That will you will see all the things that are sort of a requirement for this grant, um, and then you will complete a stipend form, and these will both be done on DocuSign. Um, so those two forms, as well as a Qualtrics survey. Um, are at this point what will be required. So it's not an enormous, you don't need to write some big paragraph or whatever. You do need to talk a little bit about why you want this in the Qualtrics. Um, and let's see, it's 1101. And I believe we may have um, guests joining us. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. Uh, let's see where we're at here. Um, are there any burning issue questions that people have right now that they would like answered? There's, there's one in the chat, so I'm going to answer that. Okay. Actually, well, I'll let you answer the RSA training one. Um, okay. But Young asks, is the FQHC work setting commitment only after graduation, or does it include the second year practicum? And importantly, you are encouraged to do that, but there isn't like a work payback with this one. So um, the goal is that we would love for you all to do this work, and we're hoping that by you 
um, like learning about these sites and starting to get introduced to them and hopefully interning at one, um, you will follow up with that and do that work. But in terms of your, your placement does not have to be at an FQHC in order to be eligible for this stipend. It's great if it is. Obviously, that's what we want and we're doing other things to get folks in there. But we've framed it that you're either in one of those sites or you're a connector to those sites so that you're taking this knowledge and information no matter where you are and sort of becoming a, an ambassador for IDH. So um, that, you know, so that's part of the webinar piece. And so that's why folks from school, college, where, you know, some of you in college, you, you know, you're thinking like, ah, this isn't the kind of work that I do. I don't do integrated behavioral health. I'm going to be at a college. And so thinking about what are the ways that your college might be helping folks connect with that. Um, and then, you know, obviously we have 29. So we, we do prioritize folks who are doing the IDH stuff. But like this year, you can see folks are everywhere. Um, so, so I hope that's, hope that's clear. Yeah. Um, thank you for clarifying mm -hmm. that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm trying to see. Tori, your hand is up. Um, yeah. Maybe we can take Tori's question and then we can turn it over to the community partner. Yep. Thank you. Um, I yeah. just wanted to clarify whether this is open to students starting their practicum the second year for the first time, um, or is it open to students who are graduating? I wasn't quite sure. You have to be in your second year placement. So if you're just taking 705, 706, 736, like the first internship sequence, you would wait and apply to the following year. Good news for you, we have this grant for four years. So um, you, the, those of you who are, in, who are just gonna be doing your first placement, not eligible this year, but come back and apply for it the following year because you would be eligible. It's for when you're in 890, 891, that sequence. Great, thank you. Yeah. Yep. Great. Uh, I'll let you turn I, it over I, to community partners. Yes, <laughs> I am going to just answer one question. Those of you who get the RSA training stipend, you're also available. You're also eligible for this. So in theory, you could get twenty thousand. The RSA training stipend has a work payback. The HRSA stipend does not. So other questions, feel free to reach out to us. But I would like to open this up um, to our partners, and I want to introduce Danny Marchman, who is here. Dare I pin you? Hello, good morning. Yes, um, I don't know if other people, um, let's see who else is on here. Hey, Julie, oh, Bain is here from the on too. Yes. Great. Um, okay, so is there, I think that first of all, I just want to welcome you both and so grateful that you could join us. This is a group and, and I want to say up front, we're recording this. Are you all okay with that? We could turn the recording off now. If, okay, thank you. Um, so this is a group of students who are thinking about um, this, this process and um, Danny Marchman, I just want to introduce you. You are the director of training at Lifelong Health Services. Did I get that uh, title? In behavioral health. In behavioral health, right. Um, and Lifelong Health Services is an FQHC and has worked is looking towards taking on one of our students. And Bea Sanchez is here from San Francisco Community Clinics Consortium. Did I get that right? Okay. Um, and she, maybe you can share a little bit about what, how you work with the consortium, the, the FQHCs. Sure, Julie, you want me to do that now or do you want me to wait until when I present? And I, I can do either. It's not, it's not a long winded thing. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, it looks like, am I missing anybody else here? I think you two are, um, I don't see Rita Perez and I don't see Carol yet. So why don't you all go ahead? Um, and it doesn't matter who, who whoever wants to go first um, to talk about your site. Oh, there's Rita. I need me to pin you two. Okay. Hi, Rita. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for joining. Um, and I was just uh, inter doing introductions and you all can introduce yourselves. And again, just for everybody on the call, Rita Perez is part of SF Health Network and you oversee the primary care center. Side of the house, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, so I'm going to leave it to you all to share whatever you want. It, would any of you like to go first? 
I can go. Yes. I have a, a short presentation for students. Um, oh, great. And just to talk a little bit about what we do and what opportunities there are for students. So like Julie said, lifelong medical, we're integrated uh, FQHC with integrated clinics in Alameda and Contra Costa County. So we have clinics all over the place from East Oakland, downtown Oakland, Berkeley, Richmond, Pinole, San Pablo, all in that area. We also have a lot of homeless services programs out of West Oakland. Um, some of the things that our interns do at Lifelong, um, conducting warm handoffs and exam rooms, and this is something that has been sorely missed during COVID, but we're getting back to getting uh, patients that are working with primary care physicians to get a recommendation for behavioral health and then having a warm body being able to show up in an exam room and say, this is behavioral health, this is what we do and try to keep people from kind of falling through the cracks uh, if they might benefit from behavioral health care. Um, also helping patients uh, doing assessments on wellness, um, sleep, nutrition. A lot of folks come to us because they say they're having trouble with uh, sleep and then we find out there's really a lot more going on. Um, uh, connecting folks to our internal, we have psychiatry at our clinics, um, internal services, external behavioral health services, community resources, um, brief interventions. We do uh, SBIRT and we also do other types of screenings and interventions. We're hoping to get um, ACEs screenings more, more consistent across all of our clinics in the upcoming years. Um, and students also work individually with patients, um, teaching coping skills, doing one-on-one -on -one counseling. Um, we teach in didactic trainings for our students, a lot of different ways of working with patients. So we teach problem-solving therapy, behavioral activation, uh, coping skills, anxiety, stress management. We talk a lot about motivational interviewing, especially for folks that have combinations of chronic disease and mental health symptoms and helping them make life changes that would benefit both. Uh, we do um, consistent screenings for depression and anxiety so students can learn how to screen and intervene in some of those standard screening tools. And it goes on. Um, additionally, uh, some students do time limited case management or clinical case management, resource finding, um, helping, uh, learn systems navigation in the community and advocate for patients. You know, we have a lot of patients with really complex issues because we tend to work with folks that are Medi-Cal, Medicare eligible or um, have no insurance or uninsured or undocumented. Um, we also have quite a few patients that are homeless. Uh, we have a lot of providers that provide um, medication assisted therapy. And so we have some students that have supported patients receiving medication assisted therapy. So like opiate uh, replacement therapies and working with folks with dual diagnosis. We have uh, quite a strong group of recovery support counselors that help our patients with substance abuse issues. And so we also have the ability to help intervene with that. We have a strong smoking cessation counseling program that helps kind of identify motivational and mental health issues that are preventing folks from being successful in smoking cessation and um, interns can get trained on how to do that and intervene in that way if they're interested. And of course, you know, individual services, full uh, behavioral health assessments and um, counseling and I talked a little bit about screenings and we also run a lot of groups and students often really enjoy jumping in and helping with groups. Uh, we also have students identify uh, groups that they might be interested in running. Um, we have one, one intern right now that's creating a group around chronic disease management and behavioral health concerns. And we have a lot of flexibility in being able to let students identify areas of interest and develop a group around those interests. And then we do have, and we have some support, but students also help in, in kind of the whole process of arranging and facilitating those groups. Some of the benefits to working in our organization, um, the integrated health setting is such a wonderful learning environment because we have so many different types of 
uh, providers and support staff working on our teams, the opportunity to work with psychiatrists, community health workers, primary care physicians, recovery counselors, case managers. Uh, there's a lot of innovative, oops, grants and projects that we have, one of which right now we have a perinatal grant from HRSA that's allowed us to really focus interventions around women that are pregnant and postpartum, really strongly identifying some of their behavioral health needs and intervening early, which is really great. Um, we have a strong focus right now on DEI and anti-racist work. We actually have a, a consultant just for our behavioral health department and we're working on a project right now with them that we've um, been able to share some of our cross-cultural clinical consultations with our intern group. They've been able to attend and participate, which has been great. And um, one of the things that highlights for me uh, is the training that we do for our students. So every week we have a 90 minute didactic training weekly uh, with case consultation. So in the early part of the internship year, we tend to focus heavily on didactic training for our interns, uh, different types of intervention tools, techniques, um, different modalities motivational interviewing, all kinds of things. And then towards the end of the year, we tend to, to sprinkle in more case consultation where students can really bring cases that they're working on, questions that they have, barriers that they've come up with, and then the whole group really problem solves together. It's really an amazing learning environment and one of my favorite things to do every week. And just something that we are really proud of in our behavioral health department is some of our anti-racism work that we're doing. These are just some of the things that we're, we're doing right now. I don't need to go over all of them, but um, something that uh, the, entire, the entire behavioral health uh, department is really feels strongly about and has been promoting um, amongst our group. Um, I am the behavioral health clinical director. And so I, tend to field all the applications for internship. I can be contacted directly here. Um, and of course, Julie has my information as well. And I'm happy to answer questions that folks have about what internship could look like or do your interests or needs match what we have to offer. Thank you so it. much, Danny, for that. Um, I know we don't have too much time, but is there anybody that has a particular question uh, for Danny? I really appreciate that thorough uh, um, review of what you, everything you'll, you're doing. Um, okay. Um, well, why don't we move along? Um, Go next, Julie, if that's sure. okay with you, Rita. Yeah. I have a short presentation as well. So let me just take a moment to my screen here. Does everybody see my screen? I get some, I got some nods. Okay, good. That's a good sign. Uh, so hi everyone. My name is Bea Sanchez. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I work for the San Francisco Community Clinic Consortium. That is such a mouthful. So I'm just gonna say SFCCC. Um, and so Julie invited me today to really talk about who we are, what we do, and then lastly, my role in this project. Um, so the last speaker really talked about one of the, you know, a clinic. I'm kind of giving you a, a more overview approach as a consortium as I explain what exactly a consortium is. Um, so there we go. My slide froze for a second. So the consortium, we came about, um, in 1980s, but community clinics have been around uh, for many, many years due to inequities in healthcare and is really rooted from the civil rights movement. Um, our consortium started in the 1980s where um, community-based nonprofit health clinics came together sharing that they had similar values and concerns and they and they formed a consortium. And, and we believe in a future where all people have access to healthcare and the highest quality that is culturally, linguistically, population sensitive in a community-based setting. And so um, we come together, um, there's 12 of them, which I'll show you in the next slide here. And we kind of, we pool our resources through advocacy mm -hmm. efforts, through workforce development, and, and how can we all come together to better our quality of care for our clinic. So this is all our member clinics here. Um, I won't go through all of them. You can see their fabulous logos on here. And 
like I said, so the consortium, we're not a physical clinic. We support these 12 nonprofit health centers. Each of them function as their own entity and organization. They have their own CEO, CEO eh, can't talk today, CEOs, their own staff that operates. Um, they have their own specific patients depending on their location. Uh, the one thing we do have internally in the consortium is we have a street outreach service um, team that's been around for over 20 years and they go out in a mobile van, which is kind of like a UPS van, <laughs> and they take care of people experiencing homelessness throughout the city. And we also have um, a vet SOS um, program as well. And this is just a map of um, where some of our clinics are actually located. They are in a high need area in the community. And again, it's, it's, we, they provide primary care. They also do a lot of behavioral health. And that's really um, why I was participating in this program is because there is a huge need in, in the behavioral health workforce. Um, again, it's, you know, not just primary care, we, um, you know, connect people to different health plans, food programs, health education and support. Um, and they, you know, we take any patient regardless of their ability to pay and their government, they're governed by usually a community board and also CEO board members, um, our, our board members for the consortium, and they must follow, um, have a, follow a specific performance and accountability requirements through the federal government. And so some of our clinics are FQHCs and some are community health centers and some of them look like an FQHC, but they're not. And so I won't go into the depths of that because we can go down a big rabbit hole, but all of them serve. <laughs> I, I heard a giggle. I think that was real. Yes, you can go to a rabbit hole of that, but um, everyone serves, um, you know, the most vulnerable populations in San Francisco. Just, this is very outdated. I apologize. These are our numbers from our patient data um, in 2018. So I won't go too much in depth of this, but you can see the types of patients that we serve, income status, and the types of payments um, to uh, for, for each of our clients. And just more about workforce development. So workforce development in general, it's, it's a huge broad topic, but really my role, uh, my role is actually created from the consortium because our member clinics CEOs and them saying, you know, workforce development is this huge issue, not just behavioral health, but overall across the board. And my role is really to support them. I work for the clinics and how to get recruitment, retention, and, and provide help provide training topics um, for their for the clinics. I also manage the Area Health Education Center, which is the acronym is AHEC. Sorry for throwing all these acronyms at you today. Um, but was really started in the 1970s because the federal government um, acknowledged that there was a shortage in healthcare providers, which no surprise to anyone here, healthcare providers are still at a shortage. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, AHAC still exists and there's over 200 of them and the consortium is actually an AHAC. And we partner with different schools like SF State and hopefully creating pipeline programs into careers of community health centers. And that's really some of my role is to educate students there are careers in FQHCs, whether that's behavioral health or that could be medical assistance, primary care. Um, but my role really in this project is Julie approached me many, many months ago and we signed a letter of support um, for this wonderful project that's very needed into community health centers. Um, and my role is really trying to connect our clinics to um, create a program for students. I think that's something that they asked for when I got this role is how do we get more partnerships with schools and how do we create our own student programs? And each of them already do. And, and, and some of them already do have their programs, um, but some of them are not, uh, do not have the staff capacity as others. Some of them have like 500 employee staff. Some have just like 20. And so how can we you know, how can I support them in continuing the work to create pipeline programs for their staff? Um, and the biggest need right now that I hear from all of our member clinics is behavioral health and how do we get more of that workforce? And one of our clinics is actually um, working with Julie right now to develop um, a licensed marriage family therapist um, student training program. So more to come on that, um, but we're hoping to get more of our clinics to jump on board on this opportunity. And so I will stop there because I said a lot already. So if any questions, I'm happy to answer. And then I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you so much, Bea. And I just want to acknowledge how um, how much I appreciate our partnership. And and um, 
you know, and what you're doing to support this collaboration. Uh, it is, it is a work in progress, the pipeline. So, and I really appreciate your presentation. Um, it was really, really helpful. I think there's so many systems that we're working within healthcare that it's really nice to have the big picture. Um, okay, well, I'm gonna hand this over now to Rita Perez. All right, thank you. So I also have just a very quick PowerPoint so that you guys can get a sense of who we are. So um, I'm Rita Perez. I'm the primary care behavioral health manager here for, um, for primary care. Um, so we are a part of the San Francisco um, Department of Public Health. We're under the San Francisco Health Network. Um, and I can get this to move. So this is just really quick. I don't think this is a surprise to anyone that um, when patients come in for their health care, there is a lot of other needs that also come up. So at least 70% of our medical appointments also have other issues that are coming up. And so you can see that it's ranging from mental health to substance use for children. It can be developmental issues or other problems that are related to childhood. Um, there's also things related to um, chronic disease and unhealthy behavior, issues related to family, um, and of course, somatic complaints that are a result of stress. Sorry, I'm having some mouse issues. So we are embedded in the clinics um, and our top 10 reasons for why we get the referrals from our um, medical team, as you can see, range from depression, anxiety, chronic pain, stress, alcohol, insomnia, issues with um, managing the diseases that they have, substance use, um, traumatic stress, or cognitive impairment. Our teams, our behavioral health teams are comprised of what we call behavioral assistants. Um, and they are the ones who do um, more of the sort of lightweight case management. They are the ones who do the linkages to the resources um, and they can work independently without being connected to a behavioral health clinician. So a referral can be made independently to them by the doctors if that's what's needed. Um, they'll also do, um, ordering of medical equipment, helping out um, fill, filling commonly um, used forms. They may be helping locating IEPs if the parents are having challenges with those. Um, and our behavioral health clinicians are, are that. They are the ones who are providing the therapeutic brief services. Um, we also have a psychiatrist on the team or a psychiatric nurse uh, practitioner. Um, so our services are short term. We're really targeting the mild to moderate symptomatology that the patient is presenting with. Um, it can, you know, very similar to some of the work that's already previous presentation on, on what happens in terms of being able to introduce the services that we provide, completing that biopsychosocial assessment, um, and really targeting the reason that the referral was made. So, you know, as on the previous slide, it could be for depression. There may be other things that are happening, but we're really gonna target the depression and provide brief interventions for those. Um, by brief, our sessions range from one to 10 sessions. Uh, it's non-traditional from outpatient setting in the sense that uh, your appointments could be 15 minutes, to 45 minutes. Um, they don't necessarily have to happen weekly uh, because it just depends on, uh, because of the issue, the frequency of, of when you may see the patient. So it's, you may quite possibly have a patient for a period of eight months and only see them eight times. And then again, you may have a patient for two months and only see them three times because that's all they need. Um, it's learning how to document in our wonderful electronic health record system that's called EPIC, um, helping to assist with any follow-up or additional linkages to ongoing behavioral health services if that's what's important, um, and connecting and linking to psychiatry if that's indicated. So one of the things that we want to do is because, um, I'm sorry, I was getting a text there. Uh, we have limited psychiatry time. So 
uh, often our patients are very good about advocating for themselves and, and come in and say, I want to see a psychiatrist. Well, first thing is to have the screening and the assessment um, done by the behavioral health clinician to make a determination if that's appropriate. Sometimes it's just the work with the clinician and, and that's sufficient. And then there's other times where it's completely appropriate to make that appropriate for this, uh, to make the referral for the psychiatrist. Um, so we have clinics that cover all over the city and as of today, there is a possibility of um, one placement at each of these sites. So uh, as you can see, we provide services for adults, children, and families. We also have some clinics that specialize only with youth. And then we have some clinics that specialize only with adults. So if I did my math right, I think it's 14 different ones that we have. <clears throat> um, off to the side here, you'll see that there's um, uh, our, our specialty clinic, clinics uh, in terms of Curry Senior Center. That's again, they're working with seniors. Um, Tom Waddell has a really high, um, they really, their population is, is, a, is a very challenging one. They're located in the Tenderloin. Um, and so there's a, they deal with a lot of um, homeless and marginally housed patients. Um, and it's, while it, there is a lot of therapeutic work that takes place, it, there's also a lot of clinical man, case management that happens as well. And um, the patients there tend to be held longer than the traditional uh, 10 sessions just because uh, we are the safety net and those pa that particular clinic, um, they do such a great job of connecting and because the patients have such a difficult time, they may not connect anywhere else. So we really hold on to them a little bit longer there. And I apologize because this is a clinic that we have here for HIV or positive um, and or risk, um, but that is, I should have deleted that. That is not, um, and I think I don't have it on the map, but that's not some place that we would be doing, um, that there's an internship site that's available there. However, I will say that at um, Southeast Health Center, which is located way over here in the Southeast sector, the Southeast um, Health Center has two specialty programs. And one of them is called um, the Early Intervention Program. And that is working with individuals who are HIV positive and at risk. So even though we don't have it at, at the PHP, which stands for Positive Health Program, there is, a po there is a possibility to work with that particular population over at Southeast Health Center. Um, okay. And then, and this just a very, broad picture of where we fall in the um, Department of Public Health. Um, so you can see this is our, our org and here where the arrow is, is where we fall in terms of primary care. Um, and then a picture, this is a picture of, of some of our clinics that you can see the outside of them. Um, and then again, we work as part of a team and that includes the interns that we will be having. And open for any questions. Um, I'm the recruiter, the coordinator, the planner. Um, our trainings, this is the first year that we have had second year MSW students. So the way I currently have got the training schedule may look slightly different next week because I'm playing with something. Um, but right now I'm alternating it so that it's a didactic group for the first month, it's um, didactic trainings. And then after that, um, 